I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 17 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As, I, as a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Wish Wilson. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The Senate congratulates incoming US President Biden on his victory and welcomes his commitment to tackling the climate crisis, particularly his acknowledgement that climate change is an emergency and an existential threat, and calls on the Australian government to match his target of zero emissions electricity by 2035, if not earlier. Is the proposal supported? Yes, the proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you, Deputy President. Donald Trump lost, and on the 20th of January, whether by his own volition or escorted from the building by Secret Service agents as a trespasser, his shadow will darken the White House no more. This moment that the world is sharing in is profound. Many people across the United States and across the world are attempting to make sense of what has happened and what now comes next. It is clear from what we have seen that this end of a despotic era where the United States came so close to embracing fascism was brought about by young people, by people of color in Nevada and Arizona and Atlanta and in Detroit and so many cities in between, rising up, working together, calling for change. It is uh, excellently summed up, I believe, by Representative uh, Alessandro Ocasio-Cortez, who said in the lead up to the election, the fight was one of allowing American democracy to live another day. And as it has been given the opportunity to live another day, so has hope for action on the climate crisis, global action. President Biden has committed clearly to decarbonize uh, the electricity system of the United States by 2035. He has acknowledged that climate change is an existential threat to humanity offering a global opportunity to reset the climate conversation and take action that young people are demanding. What we have seen as a reaction from Australian so-called leaders is shameful. The Morrison government has signalled that it is not going to take further action, and Labor is currently torn apart by division about whether to shift at all. In my state of WA, the McGowan Labor government just voted down a Greens Climate Act that would have begun the work. This is not good enough. Young people do not accept it. The Greens do not accept it. It is clear now more than ever that there is an opportunity for climate action globally, and we in the Greens intend to work with the community to seize that opportunity. Senator Steelejohn, your time has expired. Senator Bratt. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Senator Waters, I'll just make sure the mic's on. Thank you. Uh, I think I just need to formally move this MPI, given that our remote participating senator okay. isn't able to All do right. so. So Thank I you. hereby do that. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Senator. Sorry. Senator Bragg. Thanks, well, this is a great opportunity to talk about the US-Australia relationship, and I think that regardless of who had won the presidential election, 
Uh, the relationship that our country has with the United States is so complex and deep across military, economic and cultural factors that the relationship was always going to withstand uh, any particular judgment made by the American people, uh, just as governments of the day in Australia uh, you know, are here for a temporary period and then ultimately it's the relationship which is there over the longer term. So the relationship was always going to be very strong regardless of the outcome. But this is not an opportunity for Labor and the Greens and others to try and resume the energy wars. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, it was always very strange that people had tried to push energy into a culture war, because at the end of the day, uh, any sort of obsession with a form of energy generation is frankly weird. Uh, and what I would say is that the only group that is having a, a culture war or an energy war at the moment internally uh, is the Labor Party, uh, which really can't decide uh, what it wants to do in relation to energy generation. And so people want to talk about net zero and targets and the like. And Australia has a, an, an unparalleled, frankly, record in getting our emissions down. So we've beaten our Kyoto targets. Uh, we're on track to beat Paris. Uh, and in fact, uh, on a comparative basis, uh, we're doing better than most of the other uh, OECD jurisdictions when it comes to actually uh, reducing our emissions uh, over, the, uh, over the course of the, of the Paris uh, Accord. And so, yes, there will be another uh, climate conference in Glasgow when people are able to get onto aeroplanes and, and meet. I assume that will be done in person. And uh, as people who followed this closely will know, we've already committed, as part of our Paris obligations, uh, to, getting towards, uh, to getting to net zero. And so the question is, uh, when does that happen? And rather than trying to put in place a commitment which we don't know that can be kept at a particular point in time, uh, we have committed to our Paris obligations. We're on track to meet and beat them. And in due course, there will be further statements made in relation to the Glasgow commitments that our country will make. But with our, with our track record already so strong, uh, I think it is ridiculous for people to try and drag uh, our our progress on emissions reduction into an international relations uh, discussion. Uh, frankly, it is, it is, it is desperate. A and so our agenda is to develop a plan to get to the target before announcing the actual target, because that is what you do in the real world. And I have to say that uh, people tire of politicians promising things and then not delivering them. Now, surely the people of Australia uh, and I think this has been supported at the ballot box, want to see politicians, want to see governments uh, promising things that are deliverable and delivering a framework alongside a commitment, which is effectively what we've had in the past with the Kyoto and the Paris Accords. And so at the moment we have a plan on the table. The national government has a plan which is technology neutral, uh, which is which is going to get us to the place we need to be. Now, today we've seen my home state in New South Wales deliver another plan, which is a significant investment into clean energy, uh, driven by the market, supported by the government, uh, which is going to see significant new investment into wind, solar and, of course, pumped hydro. So you've got the, the national government with a a technology neutral plan uh, which is going to support clean energy, which is going to support the transition. And then you've got the states coming in behind that and supporting that. So I, I am optimistic uh, that we are going to be able to get to this net zero target uh, in, a, in a reasonable timetable. But of course, uh, you need to see the plan, you need to see the formula, you need to see the framework, because otherwise it's just an empty promise uh, without any, any backing. And so I think the, the reality is that the, the relationship that we have with the US is very strong. Uh, it would have withstood any, any particular judgment made by the American people. These two democracies uh, you know, go back in, in, uh, in conflict, back to the First World War. We've always been there uh, with a very strong relationship with the United States. Uh, and so any suggestion that there is a 
uh, an opportunity for us to have a Barney with the US now over climate policy is simply very misguided. We have always been in, in, in the, these climate discussions. Uh, we have not left any of the multilateral institutions or any of the groupings. Uh, we're in Paris. Uh, we're in the TPP. Uh, the US had left both under the Trump administration, and I'm sure that they will come back. Uh, but we've been there as a responsible global citizen with targets that are appropriate for our economy. And over the next few months and years, we will continue to make our contribution as a significant economy, which is doing a lot on emissions reduction. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, Australia has the 12th or the 13th biggest economy on earth. It's a serious economy. It's an outward-facing economy. All of these judgments that we make about our economy are actually very important to people's lives. So they're not just you know, boxes or bits of paper that we don't think about that have no real impact in the real world. And so the methodical approach that the Energy Minister Angus Taylor and the government will go through in determining these future targets uh, will factor in all the economic and all the climate factors. But I would say that we are beyond the culture war and the energy wars. I think we're in a good place as a country. We've got a technology-driven focus which doesn't feature punitive taxation or any particular uh, you know, um, preference for any particular form of energy generation. Now, clean energy is up to, I think, 18 per cent of generation in Australia today, which is a great thing, right? And a lot of that was achieved with significant market intervention. Uh, now, that is not necessary because clean energy is actually uh, now very economic in its own right, and it's now appropriate for the, for the government to step back and to allow that market to, to work with the price signals that, that are already in place. So our, our bilateral relationship with the US is as close as any two countries could have. And I, I'm sure that our government will work closely with the incoming administration on this, on trade and all the other important economic and environmental matters over the next few years. And we will take a plan to Glasgow, which is appropriate for Australia, which is in keeping with the tenor of our commitments that we have made over the last two climate conferences, certainly to Paris and to uh, Kyoto and also to Copenhagen. And it will be a serious, credible bid, and we will meet and beat that, unlike many of the other countries uh, that we often hear uh, lecturing us uh, from abroad. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, and uh, I would like to add my voice to those welcoming the election of Joe Biden to uh, the president-elect uh, of the United States of America. And I'd also like to congratulate uh, the Vice President Kamala Harris. Uh, and I note the significance of the, the first woman and a woman of colour to be elected to such a position in the United States of America uh, and the absolutely inspiring example that she will set um, for all Americans. Uh, it was incredible uh, in recent days to see a record turnout of voters exercising their democratic rights in the US and to witness the highest ever vote tally for a presidential ticket uh, in history uh, because there was uh, and there is so much at stake uh, for the US, for our region uh, and indeed for the whole global community. Um, President-elect Biden, uh, as we know, campaigned heavily uh, on the promise, the commitment of action on climate change, reducing carbon emissions and supporting the growth in renewables. Uh, the President-elect's Build Back Better plan to recover from the COVID recession is really all about um, creating jobs from sustainable infrastructure uh, and clean energy. Uh, and so it's really clear now today what direction the US is heading in uh, under the new leadership. Uh, but what is less clear, of course, is the direction of the Morrison government. Uh, and in fact, uh, this result in the US is just another sign that the Morrison government is becoming increasingly isolated internationally when it comes to action on climate change. The rest of the world is moving uh, and it's moving forward while Prime Minister Scott Morrison is dragging his feet. 
Uh, there is real global consensus on climate change, uh, and it won't just be the US under a Biden administration that will take climate action uh, and emission reduction seriously. Uh, it's the UK, it's Canada, it's Germany, France, New Zealand, uh, so many of our major allies and partners around the world. Uh, and here at home, uh, the consensus is overwhelming as well. Uh, it's the Business Council, the Australian Industry Group, the Property Council, uh, our largest airline, our biggest mining company, our biggest bank, our biggest telecommunications provider. Uh, there is a long list of leading businesses, organisations and not-for-profits who have made the commitment to taking action. Um, a long list in this country of organisations that have committed to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, and it feels like the only people who are missing in action uh, are the Morrison government. The Prime Minister is isolated on this issue. Uh, Labor, on the other hand, we are confident and we are positive about our future. We know that we can reach that better future together. Uh, really, everyone else agrees, so we need the Morrison government to make a plan now. But in the past eight years, this Liberal national government has had 22 energy policies, 22 uh, in just eight years. Uh, and what has that led to overall? It's actually led to higher emissions and it's led to higher electricity prices. Uh, and this isn't even the worst of their inaction. According to an independent report from Deloitte Access Economic economics, the Prime Minister's refusal to take action could crush trade, tourism, mining and service industries. Their report suggests that the government's inaction and refusal to adopt net zero emission by 2050 will devastate the economy. That inaction could cost up to 880,000 jobs and slash 3.4 trillion from GDP by 2070. Um, so there is so much at stake here, whereas if the government took action and delivered net zero emissions by 2050, that report predicts that it would actually create 250,000 jobs. And we are here in Australia in our deepest recession in almost 100 years. Hundreds of thousands of Australians have lost their jobs and they are screaming out for a jobs plan from this government. Uh, so action on climate change will actually deliver jobs if the government, if the Morrison government embraces it. It will deliver lower power bills. It will grow the economy. It will deliver higher wages. Uh, and so now is the time for this government to take that action. Scott Morrison can no longer run his anti-climate change agenda, saying he'll only meet net zero emissions in the second half of the century. Uh, and as we heard from Senator Bragg after they come up with a plan, acknowledging that there isn't one as we stand here today. Uh, Australians need real climate action or we will all be left paying the price. Uh, now we have on the Labor team a clear target to tackle climate change, net zero carbon pollution by 2050. The world is decarbonising and we don't just need to make sure that Australia doesn't get left behind, we need to make sure that we actually take full advantage of the opportunities that present uh, to a country like ours, because uh, we have so much going for us. With the right plan and the right vision, we can be a clean energy superpower with a new generation of jobs and cheaper power bills. We all know we have some of the best wind and wave resources in the world. We have the highest average solar radiation per square metre of any continent. Uh, and we have some of the best engineers and scientists in the world to take advantage of this. So working towards a low carbon future means opportunities for our manufacturing sectors. It means opportunities for energy exports, opportunities for rare earth minerals mining. Uh, and of course, what it means is opportunities for good and secure jobs. So take, for example, Labor's plan to rewire the nation. The current energy network takes no account of the rise of renewables. It's not fit for purpose. It was designed for another time. And that's why a Labor government would take action to rebuild and modernise the national energy grid. Rebuilding the grid will create thousands of jobs, particularly in regional Australia, and 
deliver up to $40 billion in benefits. Uh, and it will only ever be Labor that will get this done. And we know it makes sense. As the Morrison government becomes increasingly isolated on climate action, uh, even the New South Wales Liberal government has announced its own plans to support more renewables. They have just announced plans to support new renewable energy generation supported by new storage like batteries and pumped hydro. Uh, and they have confirmed again that renewable energy means lower power bills. Um, so if the New South Wales Liberals get it, um, why doesn't the Prime Minister? Uh, and I am particularly proud of the progress that's being made uh, in my home state of Victoria. Um, just this week, the state government has announced that the Southern Hemisphere's biggest battery is to be built just outside of Geelong. Uh, and this is a project that will create good jobs. It will drive down electricity prices, it will boost reliability, and it will help support Victoria's transition to renewable energy. It will be good for the economy, it will be good for the environment, it will be good for the planet. And indeed, independent analysis has showed that for every $1 invested uh, in this huge um, 300 megawatt battery, uh, every $1 will deliver more than $2 in benefits to Victorian households and businesses. In addition to the big projects like the 300 megawatt battery, the Victorian government is also helping local businesses and communities access clean energy. Just recently, they delivered grants across the states to fund projects such as community solar farms, uh, community batteries and solar electricity systems uh, for sports clubs. So those projects don't just help Victorians uh, move towards the state's own 2050 net zero emissions target. Um, they also create local jobs, uh, and that's what Labor governments can do — create jobs while supporting our environment and our planet's future. Jobs in local manufacturing in regional areas like Geelong, where the old Ford factory has been transformed into a re renewable energy hub. Um, jobs in steel by setting local content requirements for all of those projects. Uh, jobs in solar installation by supporting households to install panels, hot water, uh, and batteries, creating jobs, driving energy prices down and driving our emissions down. Uh, and of course, it's not just Victoria. Uh, indeed, every state and territory is taking action to invest in renewables and drive down carbon emissions. So we call on the Morrison government and the whole parliament to unite behind 2050 net zero emissions and to unite around our future as a renewable energy powerhouse. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I serve the people of Queensland and Australia, yet I've lived, worked and studied for five years in the USA and travelled through all 50 states. And I know that under the United States Constitution, the declaration of the polls in a presidential election is not made by the media, nor by political parties, and certainly not the commentariat. The declaration of the poll is made by each state legislature. Pennsylvania has ordered a recount. Other states will follow because state legislatures are committed to counting every legal vote. As of today, not one legislature has declared a result and several states have now been precluded from declaring due to legal challenges to voting irregularities. This election won't be resolved for weeks, so congratulating former Vice President Biden is premature. Now, I understand the Greens are getting excited that a Biden or Harris presidency will advance the socialist green agenda. What will this socialist green agenda do to the United States? It will raise power prices as unreliable solar and wind energy expands and destroys baseload power generation, wiping out small and medium businesses and heavy industry. Under President Trump, heavy industry returned to the United States and brought high-paying breadwinner jobs back for American workers. The Democrats' Green New Deal will destroy those jobs forever. Americans thrown out of work by green policies will be forced onto a subsistence allowance from the government for the rest of their lives. This the Greens have euphemistically named a universal basic income, and basic it will be. According to Stanford University, these policies will destroy 4.9 million jobs and reduce America's GDP by 2.9 trillion US dollars every year of a Biden or Harris presidency. This is news to most people that I talk to, which is a damning indictment of the news media. The presentation of news is worse than just fake news. 
mainstream media has devolved to being propaganda. President Trump's greatest achievements have been ignored by fake news. So let me remind everyone of these. The lowest black unemployment rate in history. The lowest Hispanic unemployment rate in history. The lowest female unemployment rate since World War II. The highest number of black-led business startups in history. The highest number of female-led business startups in history. The first president in 30 years to not start a new war. Five Nobel Peace Prize nominations for peace deals. The socialist takeover of America will destroy these gains Senator Roberts, and end in misery. Senator your time has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it's terrific that we've got an opportunity through this uh, motion put up by the Greens today to congratulate uh, the newly elected US President Biden as well as the Vice President Harris. And indeed, it is a moment in time that heralds a new hope for addressing global climate change. It's very pleasing to see that President Biden has given a strong commitment to tackling uh, the global climate crisis. And indeed, it is leadership and global leadership that is most welcome. Because if we are going to make uh, real progress towards saving our planet from what even President Biden has acknowledged as a climate emergency and an existential threat to our existence, then we need to see the US as a major uh, fossil fuel user and global leader uh, making real progress to reduce its own emissions, uh, but also an equally important importantly, leverage into the global debates that help bed this down as a global ambition. For too long, the Australian government has hidden behind uh, the fact that the US government hasn't made an adequate commitment to addressing climate change to paper over its own lack of commitment and lack of ambition. But I have to say, this lack of ambition uh, where they you know, stood behind uh, President Trump's uh, uh, politicking and tweets and shallowness around this debate has been very convenient for the Morrison government, but it's not really steeped in the reality of where uh, other global leaders are going. Everyone would note, for example, uh, the important remarks that have come from Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, who said he shares uh, Biden's slogan of build back better and promotes the idea and indeed the United Kingdom's commitment to a green industrial revolution. And you can very much see the enormous strides that the UK's strong policy settings have made in indeed driving the United Kingdom towards that green industrial revolution. And it is here that you can really see some of the danger for the Australian community and Australia as a nation, particularly as one that is so uh, dependent on global energy trading as part of its economy. We can see here that the UK has committed to net zero emissions by 2050 and the fact that uh, Prime Minister Johnson has highlighted uh, and highlighted indeed directly to Australia uh, with a view to really supporting us moving on these issues, driving economic growth and reducing emissions goes hand in hand. They are Boris Johnson's own words. So it is high time that the Australian government got on board and it can no longer effectively just say well, we'll we will do our own we will do our own thing when it comes to climate change and we will do what is in our national interest if we're going to be true strategic partners with the US if we are going to uh, create a future for our heavy industries that are so reliant on uh, gas uh, if we're going to create a future hydrogen industry, if we are going to be a good partner in the Pacific to our Pacific neighbours with the US, then we must address climate change. We must get on the path of creating 
those very uh, industrial, green industrial jobs that Boris Johnson speaks about. Indeed, I think uh, it will herald a new era uh, with Biden uh, as president where we can look again to effective multilateralism. This is very much at the heart of what is in Australia's national interest, particularly when looking to address a climate change emergency and indeed the existential crisis to our planet that climate change represents. So I really look forward to seeing the US re reviving uh, its leadership role in global institutions. No longer will Australia be able to say we're on track to meet our uh, carbon commitments. We're on track to meet our carbon commitments uh, at the same time as it says it's going to uh, bank uh, Kyoto credits, which all of the other global leaders uh, in climate change, uh, all of those other nations say is an illegitimate thing to do when it comes to how we need to account for uh, global carbon emissions. So it's wonderful. Uh, I'm very pleased about uh, President Biden's uh, election. Of course, Australia would work in goodwill with uh, whomever uh, was elected president, uh, but it's very clear now that the American people have made a democratic decision with a record voter turnout. You know, frankly, I can understand why President Trump feels like he's uh, got his nose out of joint. Uh, because he did get a record number of uh, votes, but the simple fact is he didn't get as many votes as Joe Biden and Harris did. So it's terrific to see a reinvigorated American uh, democracy and such high levels of participation. It's also very good to see the robustness of that democracy in terms of the institutions there counting the votes and making sure that it is done credibly. I know that President Trump says he doesn't like losing, uh, and uh, indeed no one does. I can reflect on my own experience in getting unelected to this place when the Electoral Commission did indeed, uh, through uh, misadventure, lose some ballot papers that affected the uh, outcome of the election to this place. But the simple fact is there is no such evidence uh, coming forth out of the United States of America that says uh, that there is any illegitimacy to this uh, record-breaking election in terms of participation. And what it also shows, what it also very much shows, is that people will vote for strong support uh, and strong action on climate change, which was indeed a key part of uh, uh, Joe Biden's uh, election uh, campaign. We know that President-elect Biden campaigned on the promise of strong action on climate change, a commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, but also a proposed $2 trillion in clean energy spending and a zero power plant emissions by 2035. A Build Back Better plan to recover from COVID uh, and the COVID recession. It is all about creating jobs from sustainable infrastructure and clean energy. And the government likes to point to its own manufacturing agenda when it looks at this, but the simple fact is that their manufacturing agenda, uh, whilst it says it wants to pursue low emissions technology, it is not using and doesn't seek to use the structural levers that will drive the economic uptake uh, of uh, these new industries. That was clearly de delivered with the renewable energy target as being a key lever that actually has helped uh, new renewable energy industries 
gain traction in Australia. But we see a complete lack of commitment and lack of ambition coming from the Australian government. It is high time that the Australian government got itself a proper climate change policy, a policy that, it, that the Australian people can get behind because it lowers emissions and puts us on a low emissions path. The simple fact is, with the US now coming out, with UK, Japan, uh, Europe, all already on board making this transition. We do a great disservice not only in the context of the Order. impacts of Senator climate Pratt, change, but also expired. the future. Senator Wish Wilson. Deputy President, can I take, uh, take a point of order? Um, I can just ask you, perhaps, if you could ask the clerk. Senator Canavan hasn't come for his 10 minutes allocated time. Are we able to? Right. Uh, Senator McGrath. On that point of order, the list that was circulated um, by the Greens was the wrong list. Uh, so Senator Canavan was supposed to be the end of, of, of the list. We now have the correct list, which the chair has. So it goes Senator Wish Wilson, Senator Griff, Senator McKim, Senator Rice, Senator Faruqi, and then Senator Canavan for his 10 minutes. So you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying, Senator McGrath. Senator Wish Wilson, your contribution. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I was on my feet in this august chamber in 2016 when I saw the text come across my phone that President Trump had been elected. And I remember stopping my speech and, and making a contribution about that and expressing my significant concern about what dark and dangerous days we had ahead under President Trump. And I think, on reflection, looking back on that, uh, it's been entirely accurate. Um, what we learnt, uh, and thanks to my colleagues at Questions and Estimates just last week, uh, about our current uh, emissions trajectory in Australia and around the world, if Australia sticks to their current business as usual targets, that we get four degrees warming by the end of the century. Now that means massive job losses in farming, tourism and trade, especially in Queensland, Northern Territory and WA. Extreme workplace risk for firefighters, health professionals and construction workers. Huge price spikes for basic food, where only the wealthiest can afford to secure what they want. 95 per cent of irrigated agriculture in the Murray-Darling Basin wiped out. A food bowl reduced to growing predominantly cotton. Vast dead zones in the ocean. No more coral reefs and the extinction of all shellfish. Mass migration and conflict over shrinking resources. Equatorial zones will no longer be habitable, forcing people to find new places to live. Intolerable heat stress and flash flooding across most of northern Australia, making it uninhabitable for most of the year. The end of Boxing Day tests and relaxed summer barbecues. One in six animals in the world will become extinct. Now, this is based on science. This is based on fact and what will happen if the world warms by four degrees by the end of this century. We just heard two weeks ago in the latest scientific report by JCU up in uh, Queensland that 50 per cent of the corals have now gone from the Great Barrier Reef in the last decade. But there is a glimmer of hope, Acting Deputy President, because people in the US on the weekend voted for change. They voted for a different vision. They voted to change the presidency. They voted for a president who campaigned on climate change and a Green New Deal and a green jobs recovery. Now, I don't for one minute expect that that's not going to be a difficult thing for this president to achieve. He's a very divided country. But he has been very strong in his statements, as has his new administration, on acting on climate change. And our Prime Minister and this government have been buddying up to a man who has been convicted, who has been found out to have lied 25,000 times to the American people, and who in recent days has been attacking the principle of our democracy. It's time for us to change. It's time for us to accept this is a new global reality, take real action on climate change, and actually deliver a future for our grandchildren. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Griff. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Centre Alliance, I would like to congratulate President-elect Biden on his success in last week's election. When he assumes office in January, there will very much be an enormous weight of expectations on his shoulders. And I don't envy him having that responsibility, particularly given the divisive nature of um, the previous president. 
But I believe America and the world are stronger when American leadership reflects the democratic, optimistic nature of the American people. I hope the new president fulfils these ambitions. I particularly welcome his pledges on climate change and his commitment to rejoin the Paris Agreement. American leadership on climate change is absolutely essential. Few other countries or institutions have the ability or the influence to secure global commitments. Global commitments are a necessary first step in ensuring policies are adopted to prevent climate change becoming a catastrophe. And we've seen examples of that in Australia over the last uh, six to nine months. Australia is one country that can and must do more. Recent natural disasters have demonstrated the impacts climate change can have on our country. They are a reminder of the need for action and a reminder that we must raise the level of our ambitions. And we must do it soon. It has been 13 years since the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd declared climate change the great moral challenge of our time. Yet we still haven't done what countries like Britain, Canada, New Zealand and many others have done and taken serious action. I continue to hope our government accepts this reality and lets it inform their policies. And I hope that the new president's election provides the catalyst for change, both here and abroad. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, with the election of Joe Biden and the predictably graceless but thankfully now inevitable demise of Donald Trump, Australia is left even more exposed as an international pariah on climate action. So we've got the US now committing to a zero emission electricity sector by 2035, yet Australia now remains a global outcast on climate, along with countries like Russia, Brazil and Saudi Arabia. Now leave aside issues of national pride. Leave aside for now the catastrophic impact on nature, on wildlife and on billions of people mostly living in poverty around the world. This will have massive local human and economic consequences. But sadly, it won't be the coal huggers or the gas boosters in this parliament who will bear the brunt of it. Nor will it be the executives of the fossil fuel companies who have purchased the Liberal, Labor and National parties in this place. It's going to be the working people of Australia who pay the price. Because every day we waste in this place not taking action on climate on our terms, we make it even more certain that the decisions will be made on somebody else's terms. That means in the parliaments of other countries, and that means in the boardrooms of those same fossil fuel companies. And if we don't take action on our terms, then more Australians will be thrown on the scrap heap more quickly. We need to make sure that we do take the action that the climate science says we need to take. And in doing so, we need to support the people and the communities who've built their lives and their economies around fossil fuels and logging native forests, and we need to support them through the inevitable transition that is approaching us. Because if we don't support them through the transition, the transition will happen to them anyway. And we need to work with them to understand their fears, to understand their desires and support them through the transition. We have to close the revolving door between the major parties and the boardrooms of fossil fuel companies in this country. And we have to end political donations from those corporations and from the big loggers so that we can start looking after climate, repairing nature and looking after the working people of Australia who need our support. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. And it's with great pleasure that I rise to congratulate 
President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. It is a momentous victory to stare down fascism and win. It's a win for women, for people of colour, for LGBTIQ plus people, for immigrants, and it's a win against white supremacy and authoritarianism. And it's a win for science and in the fight against our climate emergency. Joe Biden has affirmed climate change as an existential threat, and he's, got, he's committed to net zero emissions by 2050, and he's got a plan for net zero electricity by 2035. Australia, in contrast, is lagging woefully behind on the world stage and is an embarrassment. But Prime Minister Morrison and the Liberal National Party are not listening. They're not listening to the fact that the science is clear that climate change is driving natural disasters and extreme weather. And at current rates, we risk hitting one and a half degrees of global heating by the end of the decade and four degrees by the end of the century, within the lifetime of children alive today. Just one degree of global heating resulted in last summer's devastating bushfires. You cannot adapt to four degrees of heating. And if Australia is going to play its part to keep global heating to under one and a half degrees, then our targets have to be at least a 75 per cent reduction by 2030. I mean, tackling our climate crisis is not about whether we meet pathetic reductions based on carryover targets from pathetic, abysmally weak targets from 15 years ago. It's about our future. It's about taking the required action to avoid unlivable conditions for, in, for children alive today. I, mean, I said in my first speech in 2014, my agenda for my time in this place is clear. I want to be able to look my grandchildren in the eye and tell them that it was during my time in the Senate that Australia turned the corner and legislated to begin the shift to a zero carbon safe climate economy. I said we had to stop subsidising fossil fuels. We should close coal-fired power stations, say no to new gas and coal, and make the big polluters pay for all the damage they are causing. But shame on this government that we are still having to call for this six years later. It's been six long years of the Liberal National Government doing nothing except the bidding of its fossil fuel donors. We know what we need to do to fight the climate emergency, but we need the political will to make it happen. It's clear this government haven't got the political will. We need to turf them out and get a government that has. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a brief contribution. Well, what a relief. The US election result is a good thing for humanity. Donald Trump is a poisonous force in global politics. And while it's become something of a cliche to say that Trump is a symptom, not the cause of the far-right extremism he represents, it's also clear that the racism and white supremacy he stands for have been dealt a big blow. We can't dismiss the symbolic and practical importance of his removal from office. All who believe in equity, in freedom, in social justice, in climate justice, cheered on Trump's defeat. As I reflect on the election result, I'm thinking particularly of migrants and communities of color in the US that have suffered much under the Trump administration, for whom there may now be some hope. I'm also thinking of the Black Lives Matter, Green New Deal, and Medicare for All activists who worked so hard to end Trump's regime. It was a joy to watch ordinary people filing America's streets with impromptu parties, dancing and laughter. We should celebrate this win in Australia. A win against the autocrats and the far right is always worth celebrating. But while we celebrate, we should also recognize a few uncomfortable truths. Trump's neo-fascist presidency was too often given a free pass or endorsed by large sections of Australia's right-wing media and political classes including some in this very chamber and some of the loudest media voices in the country. With the writing on the wall and Trump on the way out, quite a number of his former allies and advocates are now distancing themselves from his administration. But mark my words, we won't forget what they supported. We won't forget what they attempted to normalize and we will continue to challenge their reactionary and toxic politics. 
The dystopian racism and authoritarianism of the last four years have been rejected. More ambitious climate and energy targets are a good step forward. One consequence of the Biden election is that Australia will be more and more isolated in our dead-end obsession with fossil fuels led by this dead-end liberal national government. It's frankly embarrassing that our country is now even more of an outlier in addressing the climate emergency. The future is so uncertain, and in the United States, here in Australia and across the world, as COVID-19 rages on and the urgency of tackling systemic racism, economic inequality and the climate emergency only ramps up. I must say that all my strength and solidarity goes to the insurgent politicians, the grassroots activists and the social movements, which have been incredibly powerful. And it goes out to them as we begin the end of this horrific chapter in global politics. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, uh, I, I will make a, a little contribution on this, this motion here this evening. I, I, I don't have too much of an issue with the first part of the motion, which seeks to congratulate uh, uh, President-elect Biden on, on his victory. I think it's always a celebration to see a, a democratic election uh, of a leader. Um, uh, from whichever party. It's a celebration of the free uh, uh, principles that we live by here in this country, and we hope other uh, peoples around the world can similarly have their rights to choose uh, their own leaders, and uh, I celebrate that for sure. Um, it is strange, though, that the second part of the motion is almost uh, seeking to undermine those very principles uh, of, of democracy, uh, because this motion seems to indicate that because of the result of an election in the United States, we should change our own policies here. That because there was an election in the US last week involving, I don't think, it's something like 140, 150 million perhaps Americans in the end voted on, uh, that should determine the policies of our nation. Now, I, I've got this sort of quaint view that the policies that are decided in this country should be dictated by the people of this country, the free people of this country, expressing their views through a democratic process in our country, not in other nations, uh, not, not, not in other countries. Those countries are free and have every right to elect the leaders that they choose and then adopt the policies and implement as they see fit. But I firmly defend the right of Australians to decide what should happen in Australia. And this motion, this latter part of this motion, seeks to undermine what I thought that would be a pretty standard and well-regarded principle across the chamber in this place. But if we see people who otherwise support democracy and say they're against fascism and they're, they support democracy, but, but they then want to see the Australian people bound in chains by the votes of those from overseas. That, those two views are a little inconsistent and expose the, the lack of sincerity uh, of those seeking to say that they actually support democracy when they're actually, actually just seeking to get their way. That's what they want. They want to get their way. Uh, because I don't know. I, I've seen. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, there are, of course, uh, allegations in the United States of, uh, of, of fraud occurring in this election uh, that were there last week. There's allegations of uh, uh, people from interstate or different states voting in other states. There's allegations of even dead people uh, voting. But I haven't seen a single allegation. Maybe I've missed something, Madam Acting President. But I haven't seen a single allegation that an Australian got to vote in the U.S. election. Did that happen? Did any Australians get to vote in the U.S. election? I don't think anybody's made that allegation yet. I don't think that's being litigated in the United States. Maybe I'd change my view on this if there were actually some kind of voice from Australians. But I don't think yet, despite the Greens' attempt, we are not going to be the 51st state of the United States. The Greens here seem to think they want us to be part of the U.S. now. They want us to sign up and just tie ourselves to the U.S. and somehow become the 51st state of. Uh, of the Union. I, I don't want to do that to Australia. I, I, I love America. We've got great relationships with the United States, but we are a free, proud, independent nation here and should cherish and protect that. Because we actually did. They might have missed it. No one's mentioned it. I've seen this debate. I've only seen some contributions from the other side, but no one's mentioned from the other side that we did have an election here last year. It wasn't that long ago. We had our own election where all Australians uh, got to vote and have their say. Uh, on a range of issues, including the one that's dominating this debate, climate change. In fact, I, uh, I went and had a look this afternoon. The, the Guardian website declared before last year's federal election that it was, in fact, a climate change election, that the whole election was about 
uh, climate change. Uh, the leader of the Labor Party, the leader of the opposition, Bill Shorten, before the last election, uh, made in his final pitch, his final pitch a couple of days before the election, said that he wanted, he wanted to send a message to the world on climate change. His policy he made it a central part of his pitch. Of course, Labor took to the election a policy of cutting carbon emissions, Australian carbon emissions, by 45 per cent by 2030. That was a central part of their policy platform. Now, Australians had their say last year, and the Labor Party lost. They lost the election. They lost the climate change election. Australians did not sign up to impose unilateral, radical cuts in our carbon emissions that would cost jobs here and do nothing to lower the temperature of the globe. That was not the policies that the Australian people supported at last year's election. They re-elected a government that, yes, did seek to uh, uh, have a plan to cut our emissions, but do so in a way consistent with other countries around the world, or at least what other countries have said. I'll come to that. Uh, but, uh, but, but through the agreements we had made, they elected a government that wanted to see the growth of great industries in this country, like coal mining, wanted to see the Adani coal mine get going, which is up and running now. It's got 1,500 people, over 1,500 people now employed at that mine, thanks to the re-election of the Liberal National Government here in Australia. That is what should happen in a democracy. The Liberal National Government gets to implement the policies that it took to the election, and the policies of cutting carbon emissions by more than what we'd agree with other countries were rejected. And, but this motion seeks to overturn the will of the Australian people expressed just 18 months ago and impose a different set of policies because of an election in the US. What an absurdity. I'll just briefly touch on the fact that this election does sort of this, this motion sorry, does gloss over the fact too that there were many elections in the US last week. Many elections occurred in the United States, one of which, of course, the presidential election has the most, most focus. But uh, at every uh, US election there's also a, an election for the House of Representatives there. There's an election for the Senate there, at least a third of the Senate each two years. Uh, and in those elections, those elections, the policies of, of, uh, of the Democrat Party or the party that's purporting, I mean, I'm not seeking to speak on behalf of the Democrat Party of the US, but others are here in this chamber, seeking to say that you know, somehow that would, they'd want to radically cut carbon emissions. Well, they were all rejected. They, the Democrats lost seats in the House of Representatives. They, they did not take over control of the Senate. And so it's unclear that the United States will take any further action from a legislative perspective on climate change now because their, their chambers, their chambers, the ones elected by their own people, have not significantly changed uh, from before the election. That's just a small point, though. The bigger point here is what should we do? The bigger point is we should be looking to base our action on what other countries do, not what they say. And too much of this debate is focused far too heavily on what other countries are saying. Whether it's the United States president-elect, whether it's uh, a Chinese government, whether it's European governments, the New Zealand government, the re-elected New Zealand government, there's always this focus. Oh, oh, someone's come out and said they're going to cut emissions by, or they're going to go to net zero emissions, uh, whatever that means. But net zero emissions by 2050, they've committed to that. Therefore, we should act. In what universe should you do something based on what people say, not what they do? I mean, smart people sophisticated people actually base their business decisions, actions in life on action, what people actually do, not what they say, because anybody can say anything. It's very easy to say words. It's very easy to get up and say, uh, uh, I'm going to do a 10-kilometre run this afternoon. I'm going to save lots of money this year. I'm going to cut back my spending. It's very easy to say these things. A lot harder to do them. A lot harder to do them. And we've seen that uh, um, writ large through this climate change debate in recent years. For example, the New Zealand government has a net zero emissions commitment by 2050. Uh, they were just re-elected on that platform. They want to implement that. I wish them all the best as a, as a democratically elected government to implement that policy. Uh, but they also they had a 5 per cent reduction by 2020 target under the Kyoto Agreement. They wanted to cut their emissions by 5 per cent by this year. By this year. Uh, guess what? Their emissions have only gone down by 1 per cent. 1 per cent. <laughs> they have only got to 20 per cent of their target. Uh, uh, that they'd committed to back in the Kyoto Agreement. But we're meant to believe, we're meant to say, oh, no, no, it'll be different in the next 30 years. Don't look at what we've done. Look at what we've promised to do now in the next 30 years. Why would we base our decisions in this country? Why would we put jobs on the line, people's real livelihoods, people's actual jobs, uh, the sustainability of our public finances, our ability to pu fund public services? Why would we put that on the line based on empty rhetoric and statements of other governments. Why would we 
put that on the line for the sake of a, an agreement right now, the Paris Agreement, which doesn't impose any obligations on governments around the world. There's no binding commitments through the Paris Agreement at all. That's demonstrated by the fact that it never went through the US Senate. It's not actually a treaty. It's not, it wasn't ticked off by the US Senate, as treaties require, are required to do under their constitution. Uh, it's simply an agreement between different countries. They have no obligations to, to commit to it. There was no uh, enforcement mechanisms put in place at the behest of the Chinese government, who'd refused to sign up to proper accountability and enforcement under the agreement. So there's no way of even knowing if other countries are doing what they are, they are saying. So we should keep the, the, the long-cherished principle in this nation that we decide what happens here in this country, and we should continue to act in the interests of those Australians who want to work, who want to have a job, who want to see our community thrive, not, not based on the views of those not in this country and certainly not on the empty statements and rhetoric expressed by other governments that are not backed up by real action and real change. I shall now uh, put the question that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe I'll put that again. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it.